Hey there, it's Alex, my review of our GH reviewers. Just going to be uh, continuing on with the review pertaining to Warden Epic by Kyle Griffin. Uh, this is going to be chapter 13, Soul, Mind, and Consciousness. <coughs> Question. Even though you've explained how the theocrats indoctrinate people who attend religious services by conditioning them with a mixture of sensory and telepathic reinforcement, I will find it hard to understand this in terms of what I know about psychology. For example, how can the whole human race be so brainwashed that they don't even speculate consciously about certain aspects of spiritual reality? The idea that evil spirits might pose as gods and exploit people through organized religion is an obvious one, yet almost no one ever talks or writes about the whole subject or talks or writes about it. The whole subject is literally unthinkable. Also, if religious and mind control puts people in conflict with their own human nature, uh, it as happens as happens when they are taught that sexual feelings are morally wrong. Why doesn't this negative reinforcement cancel out the positive reinforcement of religious ecstasy? And even more important, more most Amer most Americans right now aren't fundamentalists. The majority don't even go to churches regularly at all, and many of those who do go to the liberal churches that don't practice religious mind control as you describe it. Since this is so, why aren't all of the facts about theocracy and religious mind control common knowledge? Uh, answer. The answer to all of these questions is the same. The theocrats simply know a lot more about psychology than people do. An electronic computer analogy applies here. People on Earth right now are like the users of a computer system. They can input and retrieve data, and they can run the existing programs to process the data in set ways. Many of them have enough programming skills to modify some of the programs slightly, but they don't understand the basic design of the software very well. On the other hand, the theocrats not only understand the software far more completely, but also have much easier access to the special command mode used to modify it. This command mode is the telepathic chain reaction used in religious mind control. Of course, trained human psychics also have access to it, and so do spirits in the invisible culture. But it is still extremely difficult to free people from theocratic control. The mind of the average person on Earth right now is run by software designed by theocrats to keep people from consciously finding out they exist. And there's no just telling people the truth. They simply can't understand or believe it. Because the mental programs they use for understanding and believing things were designed by the theocrats. Question. Almost all religious and occult literature and the majority of modern speculative writing that comes close to discussing theocracy assumes that God, demons, etc. have the power to kill humans who discover forbidden knowledge, or at the very least, to override the conscious will of humans from remembering such things or pursuing such lines of inquiry further. So what are the facts on this? Especially, uh, are the theocrats aware of telepathic conversations like this one, and what can they do about it? <coughs> Answer. Obviously, the theocrats don't have the psychic power to kill or analyze the conscious mind, so you wouldn't have survived to write this. They operate through the subconscious, and they keep people from finding out about them by making it difficult to understand certain kinds of spiritual information or draw rational conclusions from it. Uh, an explanation of how they do this is quite complex, like the answers to your first set of questions. It depends on a more complete knowledge of the nature of the mind and the soul. Uh, than you now have, and this is going to be difficult to explain. Keep in mind throughout what follows that much of the terminology, psychology, computer science is going to be misused. We have to use the words in our vocabulary that are closest to the meanings we need to convey, but they aren't always too close. First thing we need to clarify is the comparison between the human brain and the computer, between the mind and the software and data in a computer. The only similarity between the human brain and the rest of the electronic computers on Earth is that both store and process data. The methods for doing so are quite different. This is where most of the book about biocomputers and psycho... The psycho... 
it's like the psychovernetics. Psychovernetics go wrong. And they take the analogy between the brain and the computer, between the mind and computer software, much too literally. The best example is that the electronic computer details in absolute or hard values, whereas the brain deals in comparative or soft values. If you create a new file with a computer and enter data into it, the information says, uh, the information stays there exactly as entered, and you can retrieve it and make a complete original just by entering the correct access code. <coughs> if you want to delete something, you can kill it instantly, complete, completely by using the correct commands. Everything you know about the human memory and learning process makes it obvious that the human mind doesn't work this way. Memory storage and retrieval in the human mind is a cumulative rather than an absolute process. If a person's sense receives a particular set of data only once, fewer of the individual details are recorded in memory than if it is received repeatedly. Also, information may be automatically or forgotten if not periodically retrieved, a phenomenon that behaviorists call extinction. These two processes are almost impossible to analyze using a computer analogy. The electronic computer is an artificial construction designed to do exactly what the human operating system tells it to do. Let's repeat that. The electronic computer is an artificial construction and designed to do exactly what the human operator tells it to do. And it's also basically binary. A circuit uh, is either open or closed. It gives a series of yes and no answers. A computer software is designed exactly in the same way to match the hardware. Uh, the internal data processing functions of the computer can be very complex, but the complexity is always built up out of those simple binary building blocks. Neither the brain nor the mind works this way. Question, doesn't the biological principle of irritability put a binary base under the behavior of living organisms? For example, some microorganisms show positive or negative phototropism, they approach a source of light, or they move away from it. And so the analogy doesn't hold up very well because even microorganisms often show much more complex behavior than this. Biological behavior is based on a simple yes and no, but an increasing or decreasing orders, a probability that an organism will respond in a given way uh, to a given stimulus. The probability that an organism will show a given response is determined by the quantity and quality of reinforcement it perceives performing, uh, for performing that response. The behavior of the computer is based on either A or B. The behavior of the biological organism is based on degrees of A or B, with the quantitative uh, values of the probabilities being determined by environmental reinforcement of many different kinds. The computer model uh, of the mind is still useful. Though, because it's the only way even to begin to discuss the subject of the English language right now poorly as the available terminology fits the realities. For example, it's much easier to understand the concept of the subconscious if you think of the mind as the total data and programs stored in the electronic computer with many different kinds of files, each kind of having different access codes. In other words, what people call normal consciousness is a computer menu in which gives access to certain files it allows them to perform certain operations. Various altered states of consciousness gives, uh, give access to entirely different menus since the theocrats have some degree of direct access to the control mode for modifying these programs in both the physical and astral mind. They have re redesigned many of them in, to serve their selfish purposes for exploiting human beings both on earth and after death. <laughs> this was the case. Question, do they get this direct access during the religious mind control process? And if so, why aren't people who don't attend religious services immune to it? Answer, religious mind control is practiced in many different places besides religious services. The theocrats often practice it on the crowds attending sporting events and gambling casinos, at political rallies, during musical concerts of many types, and in a number of other places. Whenever many people enter an intense emotional state at the same time and have their collective attention focused on a common object, theocratic spirits can use conscious telepathic manipulation to put them into a religious trance and reprogram their minds with religious mind control. 
The Invisible College used the rock concerts, peace demonstrations, love ins, and similar events in the 60s for exactly the same purposes. <coughs> Before that, we used to, we used meetings of fraternal organizations, a variety of progressive political meetings, and even the circuses and carnivals that used uh, to visit every American village and town as the theocrats used and still use touring uh, revival meetings. And the Invisible College will continue to practice religious mind control and reprogramming for as long as the theocrats do. The important thing is to get many of the fact as possible out into the open and let people decide for themselves. It's finally beginning to happen. References to the truth about the Ukraine, the theocracy are beginning to appear in the writings of hundreds of different authors. Um, but the information is still mostly just isolated fragments, and it's also obvious that most of the people who write them down don't really know what they are, or even what they're very, or even that they're very important. Even though most of the individual facts that make up the model of spiritual reality being presented in this book already are available to the public, very few people are capable of assembling them into a coherent theory as you are doing. And this is becoming, uh, you know, this is because the mental programs they use to draw conclusions from information on spiritual subjects were deliberately designed by the theocrats to be illogical and irrational. <coughs> Question, I've wondered about this for a long time because empirical thinking appears to be the natural way for the mind to operate if you assume that the functioning of the thought process is determined by positive and negative reinforcement. Answer, correct. As a general rule, assuming that the truth is true will bring positive reinforcement, assuming that it is false, or that something other than the truth is true will bring negative reinforcement. There are exceptions to this rule, but it does operate with reasonable consistency. Enough to program people with roughly empirical methods of thinking. This is what people mean by common sense, drawing conclusions from the available observed information and being willing to modify those conclusions if they are contradicted by further information when put into practice. Of course, this can get extremely complicated, especially for what is needed for the people. Since the individual usually has rather incomplete information on a given subject, everyone makes a lot of mistakes. Also, people all tend to be cons conservative in making decisions. It's easier to ongoing something the way you've done it before than it is to change just because the circumstances indicate it might be a good idea. <laughs> Both of these exceptions are important, but you should realize they're also self-limiting. The more information you receive that contradicts your present conclusion, the more likely you are to change it. Also, your basic conservatism or inertia about changing opinions tend to give way uh, when circumstances put enough pressure on you. When you, are received, when you start receiving significant negative reinforcement for behaving in a given way, it gradually becomes obvious uh, that you should find an alternative. This is the way the mind operates in decision-making most of the time, especially in dealing with the physical world, but this kind of natural empirical reasoning is used much less than, much less often than one might expect in dealing with other people, <clears throat> and hardly at all in dealing with psychic <clears throat> and spiritual matters. The theocrats are responsible for this. The key to theocratic power in the nature of what the behaviorists call reinforcement. As materialists, they think of it as something concrete, but it also has a subjective component. And the theocrats are able to use this, uh, are able to use of, of this fact to manipulate the kind of reinforcement that people receive in response to their behavior. Question. By a subjective component in reinforcement, do you mean that a concept like pain or pleasure is subjective in the sense of being subject to interpretation by the person receiving the sensory impulses? No, the part of it is objective. The neural impulses we call pain are not the same as the one we call pleasure. They have different electrical characteristics and travel over different circuits within the nervous system. Question, yes, that's verified for what I know of scientific conclusions on the subject. When then is the subjective component? 
that's the best name for it in English is the emotional reaction to sensory stimulus. As a sensory the stimuli are received by the mind of a person in a normal state of consciousness, they cause the retrieval of, of idea and emotions from memory. This component is subjective because it comes out of memory storage rather than the, from the outside environment. And in many cases, it has more effect on decision making than the sensory input alone. Let's try a specific example. Suppose a racially prejudiced white man takes a job where the, many of his co workers are black. Initially, he tends to interpret everything they say in human ways to reinforce his existing prejudice. If they are confident and assertive, they are acting above the, their station in life. They're friendly, but being presumptuous and impertinent. <coughs> if they sense his prejudice, they keep their distance from him. Black also. This is proof that people or different races are not meant to live together, and so on. This experience should be teaching him that on the average, black people are no different than white people. His own subjective reason, sensory intake, uh, tend to prevent him from learning. Question. A behaviorist uh, literally describes the kinds of reactions, of course, because they are very common. The psychologists uh, don't even speculate that a deliberate conspiracy is responsible for those elements of human behavior that are irrational or self-destructive. Instead, they take a Darwinian approach. For example, in the case of cited above, they'd say that the prejudice plan learned as prejudice to their environment, who he had little personal contact with black people, he received positive reinforcement from prejudice to whites around him, which were showing negative emotional reactions when blacks were mentioned. So he became prejudiced. When he enters an environment where he comes in contact comes in contact with black people, their prejudices can be a function of memory extinguished. These prejudices. Um, this is a process very similar to random mutation and natural selection. And so this process does account for a lot of human behavior. However, mental programming for people had experience has to be added into the equation. If people had no program to experience or adjust to new situations in their environment, so they encourage uh, encourage emotionalism over rationality. People make decisions rationally. They're harder for the class to control. Religious mind control is a delicate process. Between religious trance is a rather shallow one. Here. If people in a religious trance perform rituals that are unfamiliar or hear a preaching that seriously contradicts their existing beliefs, they return to a normal state of consciousness. Effective religious mind control can be practiced during rituals only. And these rituals uh, remain uh, relatively. This is also one of the principal reasons why theocratic religion uh, is socially and politically conservative or reactionary. Question I still don't see how the theocrats can program the minds of the entire human race so thoroughly uh, that the truth about theocracy has never become common knowledge. Answer a few people wrote history how, in fact, wrote various elements of the truth of theocracy and wrote them down in religious and occult literature. However, these elements were always fragmentary uh, and more important, I think, neither the people uh, who found them nor the rest of the human race were capable of fully understanding them. Especially, no one was able to design experiments to discover further elements of this knowledge and work towards a unified theory to explain the whole thing. Question. Why would the entire human race find it so hard to get the same breakthrough that I'm in, uh, which enables me to discover and accept this kind of information? I understand at least partially. Well, religious mind control works on believers, but why should the minds of everyone else be similarly affected? And so this comes back to the basic uh, behaviorist theory that human personality is uh, conditioned uh, into by the physical environments. This includes the mental programs that they use to evaluate data and decide what is true and what is false. Even if you leave direct telepathic programming during religious mind control out of the picture, people will receive their programming from both the physical and social environments. Programming from the physical environment usually favors empirical thinking, but that from the social environment favors acceptance of doctrine and faith. On a large part of the customs and beliefs and instinctive emotional reactions that make up the 
this social environment were created by Hippocratic religion. The further back you go in human history, the greater percentage of people who were devout believers in theocratic religion and were subjected to religious mind control to a significant degree uh, throughout their lives. Question, this definitely appears to be true when we look at Western history over the last thousand years. I can see gaps further back. Uh, for example, it doesn't seem as if uh, either the Romans or the Greeks were very devout during important periods of, of their civilization. A, on the contrary, the vast majority of the population of those civilizations were devout believers in pagan religions that practiced effective religious mind control. However, there were periodic weakenings of religious belief among certain segments of the population which allowed important occult, philosophical, political, and scientific works to be written works based on some degree of empirical thinking. Remember, the Greek and Roman philosophers were just a, a tiny elitist group of intellectuals. The majority viewpoint then was not that of Socrates, but that of the people who condemned him to death. The hold of theocratic religion on most Earth's living population did not begin to weaken until the modern era. From the 1300s down to the present, and even today, the greater part of the population is still subject to religious mind control. Modern civilization does program people with personality structures uh, that resist religious mind control, but the cuts have been able to capture a, a big small link along these lines by resorting to electronic mind control. Question by researching the secret societies and the forces manipulating human civilization as given. The impression that the invisible college also makes use of both religious and electronic mind control. <clears throat> the answer this is true. We discuss electronic mind control in more detail in the next chapter. A really good chapter. Um, chapter 13. Uh, I really dig that there is other people out there who um, discovered that some of the difficulties uh, that exist throughout society. Um, and I know there's some who look at it, it's like, yeah, when you read a content regarding that sort of stuff, specifically in regards to some of the turbulence and battle and, 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 and war that seems to be fought at times uh, in, in, in certain kind of places pertaining to Earth, um, that somehow, like, oh, is, is it always good? You know, it is like, you know, like they're good around. Because like, when I read these content, I'm like, all of a sudden, well, I think it's a lot uh, more. Like, I think there's a lot of good out there. And, and when I say that, someone like, oh, well, why do you have to say that when you create content like that? And why don't I say that in regards to my own content? Well, the answer is that I do. And I do say that there's a lot of good in regards to uh, what I've relayed. I think that there is more good than bad, which makes these questions even more important because, I mean, of course, logically, there is some people who say, hey, how is it that logically you can say that? Well, logically, if we came from um, a place of morality, a place of self, um, if those origin theories regarding are true, um, then it stands to, to say that there is, you know, a larger um, amount of, of morality than immorality, and that they safeguarded certain kinds of things when certain events took place. Um, and I think a part of, of, of what we're, what we read here is in regards to certain kind of catastrophic events that happened a long time ago, um, where societies were formed in regards to that. Uh, some of them, and, and regardless, the emergence of immorality would happen uh, to a certain extent. But if the, if the emergence of immorality did happen afterwards and we did emerge from morality, I have faith that there is those, there is more of, of uh, good than there is the bad. Um, I think that there was multiple kinds of things that happened when the first struck out. I think pretty much everybody already knew if, if, if when it happened in a certain context if we're talking about one that happened down the road if we're talking about one that happened beforehand then you know everyone dropped what they were doing some probably knew to a certain extent um and every, you know everyone you know said are you okay you know imagine imagine the first time somebody you know cussed somebody out or somebody first time somebody swore or got angry or had an argument or whatever it is and yeah there's there's probably different kinds of things that you see from it but the you don't know why, because that, that's how you feel about it. You don't believe in that. Well, I think some are trying to say that somehow, why do you believe in more good? I'm like, well, the spiritualist communities, from what they're experiencing in regards to near-death experiences and things of that nature, tell me that there is good in more places out there. Um, and I really do truly believe that we, that we come from good uh, to a certain extent. You think about ethical mechanisms in regards to certain people, right from wrong, and understanding that. And a lot of physical humans understand right from wrong. They, they know what's, what's you know, that sort of thing. And 
in affecting them. Just because you don't have those mechanisms doesn't mean that that isn't the case. Doesn't mean that you don't adhere to morality. Because as we've noted, there has been certain kind of stealing in spiritual at times in regards to uh, certain things that have taken place. So there might be certain kind of operating out there. Um, without a certain kind of, of, of guidance um, of ethical, and, and sometimes, you know, I've noted certain kind of head area mechanisms that exist in regards to understanding ethical, um, but there is a natural in regards to it where we know right from wrong. We know, like, even if there is no certain kind of guide over the head area, you know, a certain kind of machinism put on behind the scenes spiritually, um, there's different kinds of technology, different kinds of anatomy, all different kinds of things like that that can affect ethical thinking. Um, in a certain sense, then, you know, it, there's still a natural to it. Uh, you know, I think we, we, we're, we're, we're beings of light. We're from the light. Mm. And I still feel like the original setting is good. Mm. Like, that's how I feel about it. Like, I know some, there's, there's some scientific speaking here or saying, but technically, um, but, you know, technically, you know, there is, there is that. Because we could say without that setting, where would we be? But, <laughs> and, and well, that's that's one thing you're talking about. Well, that was the thing of it. It's, it's not meant that way. It's not meant to be upsetting. Yeah. But there is that sort of thing that says that hey, technically speaking, something that's not necessarily morally good. Um, it's rather it, it, some say that it is. Well, okay, all right, that's fine. Um. But I, I do want to say that that I, I do feel like good exists. I mean, that's that's how I feel about it. I think that there is sometimes certain lenses put on certain processes where it feels dire, where it seems like there's no good out there, where it seems uh, like uh, you know certain kind of baddies have more power than the good. And I think it's crap. I don't I don't think it's true at all. Um, and on this physical planet Earth, uh, you you look at societal, and there's more good than bad. I mean, this is the case. That some people look at other things and say, oh yeah, but we're being brainwashed or whatever it is, but you know, in, there is certain moments throughout history where the church did help, where it was decent. Um, there is places out there would take a look at the opposite and say there's times when, you know, no faith emergence, uh, no belief emergence and that sort of thing. And all of a sudden it's just this scientific place where science has done some of the damage and science has been doing some of the damage. We're lucky that we're in a day and an age now where we have that sort of leeway. Um, you know, where they're not burning witches. All right, well, okay, all right. Then. It, but there is moments throughout our history where it's not necessarily the church, um, where it is science uh, to a certain degree. Um, and I think that there are moments that in having belief, I remember, uh, you know, it's like medium even said that, you know, there's people who have it, an outlet. If you have an outlet, then, then it can be good. It, it can help. Um, you know, believing in something can be decent. You know, those who are following, you know, Christianity, those who are following Islam, those who are following certain kind of faiths. Um, if your soul feels like following those faiths, um, then maybe there's something there. Maybe it isn't, uh, you know, mind control. Maybe it, it, and I don't think that it is for, uh, for a decent portion. And I do feel that there is certain kind of mind control. I've discerned it as a psychic medium in regards to certain kind of faith worship um, to a certain extent. When I was reading this l last episode, uh, in regards to the, this, this War in Heaven review, I noted certain kinds of things happening in regards to congregation. And it has to do with this, um, it, it's a head area energy that I'm able to discern at times. And I don't know what to tell you, about it, but it, it is scary uh, to a certain extent. Um, but it, it's still, there's still many really, really good things uh, within the confines of religion. There is, there is a lot of goodness. There's a lot of um, safety. There's a lot of uh, discussion. There's a lot of decent things uh, within the confines of, of, of earth-based religions and faith. Um, and I think that, that there is a, a sort of a misunderstanding at times in regards to uh, this. Well, there is. I've been one of them. I've looked at it. I remember earlier on, I was thinking about Christianity. I'm like, um, you know, what, what, what the heck? I, I just thought about Christianity. It just didn't fit the bill for me. It just didn't fit didn't work for me to a certain extent. And then it's interesting now after becoming a psychic, after noting certain kind of energies uh, and things of that nature that I'd look at Christianity and say that I am a Christian in a certain sense, but I'm also other things too. I'm not just a Christian, you know, it, the other kinds as well that Nate Spirit Guides indicated in a certain sense. Um, it's one of those things that I look at a scene in a movie, of course it had to be a movie, but uh, it was one of those things where, it, it, you know, someone spoke, some spoke to each other as Christians. And I could see that an honesty was there. It was a certain kind of honesty. It really, truly. Mm. Um, well, it, 
and it was it's almost like a certain kind of lens you, you take off the sunglasses to a second to a certain degree or you know you take off your tie or whatever else it is um and you speak to the person honestly um and that that kind of reminds me of, of christian of christians you know to a certain degree um and i don't think it's it's a bad i, I think that within multiple religions uh, i think there is obviously different kinds of uh, conversations in, in regards to directions and things of that nature uh, but I, I do feel, feel like uh, it's a utilization of difficulty some are looking at certain things saying that hey um you know w within the confines of, of certain utilizations not just in regards to religion and faith as has been noted uh, one of the things what we see is, is that certain kind of culture like to utilize certain things but there's also a decent in the mix and the decent in the mix that I've been able to note uh, at times uh, has to do with certain kind working together. And if we knew that immorality uh, cultures exist behind the scenes, uh, sometimes in interaction with moral societies, um, and the way the spirit realm can work um, isn't always so that we couldn't work together. <laughs> like imagine that there is machinisms where it, there is a viability pertaining to certain kinds of uh, moral society and immoral society working together. And in working together, sometimes you see people's coming together and, 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 and never wanting to break apart regardless of you know, one side or the other uh, because the glue that holds them together happens to be the, 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 the that in which uh, they care about to a certain degree and who cares about them, who cares about both society. <clears throat> and it's beautiful and amazing. And I have been one of those uh, people who've been in the mix kind of at times breaking certain people apart and not meaning to be, to be true. But I have also been one of those people who've been trying to help in a certain kind of context um, and who's also been moved past that, who, who's moved past that sort of thing and says, hey, if those societies aren't going to give a shit about me in a certain sense and going to receive that sort of, uh, you know, attack and all of then why should I give a shit about them either? I sort of move past certain things in a certain context because I don't want to be harmed in it. Simple as that. And if that's going to be what it is for some kind of culture in regards to that, then, you know, let me be Judas. And we're, all right, well, all right, that's kind of how I feel about it to a certain degree. Right? Well, all right. Uh, regardless, though, there is decent in regards to that sort of um, direction, that sort of working together. Um, and the working together really does work. You've seen it throughout society, and it's it's, it's why it is that does somebody asks uh, as to why we are seeing certain kinds of culture exist behind the scenes spiritually at times um, in regards to earth-based and others. And, you know, the, the answer can't be because we're talking about it. No, like they, they can't even be really the answer to a certain degree. I mean, not really. <laughs> well, okay. Because again, we look to earth-based society and a lot of it is good. Again, one of the things that I think that some people have um, that negative thinking really does impact. And when people looking at the world saying, oh, it's a bad place, I'm like, I, I think there's a bit of a misconception. I think it's, there's a bit of a difficulty. Sure, there's accidents that happen, but I don't know if it's a bad place. That's, that's, there is certain kind of safety issues in regards to certain kind of operating of machinery and, and proceeding in life uh, to a certain degree. And one of the things in regards to it, you'll see you know, accidents happen out there to a certain extent on this physical planet Earth. Spiritually speaking, though, and in a feng shui, if we can put certain spirits in a certain spot spiritually where there's no accidents, I mean, some people will be saying, okay, yeah, that sounds to be decent to a certain degree. Um, specifically, there's just to be problematics in regards to discussing certain things and then things of that nature. All right, okay, correct. That was what you did. That was the case of this. <sighs> yeah, no, not good enough. And uh, one of the things then, you know, I sort of saw was that, uh, that I think there's a lot of good. A lot of people learning, a lot of people having fun, a lot of people experiencing life. And there is some negatives in the mix. You take a look at the crime rate and all that sort of stuff, even the wars, you put it together and it's not really, even, it, it is a fraction, uh, but not a big fraction in regards to the kind of peace and enjoyment that's happening. Now you put negative, negativity in the mix and that is, a, that is a fairly decent sized portion, but you take a look at the negative and it can be decent to a certain degree, which says we can still maintain balance even by way of of promoting certain kind of negative sadness, depression, and things of that nature, um, they're, they're fairly decent. And in regards to some who don't want to experience it, that's the difference. But in regards to others, I mean, sometimes I feel sad. Sometimes I feel sad and I want to be, you know, 
able to be sad. And it is a negative, but it doesn't mean that, that there, there's not more joy in the world happening. And even if there is, isn't, sadness is one of those ones that I kind of feel like that's not a bad thing. There's nothing, you know, it's not bad to be sad for what's acceptable. I mean, sometimes it is for some. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, in a certain sense, being uh, suppressed in a certain manner. Um, yeah, I don't think, I don't know if, if watching, you know, television and things like that is as bad as what some people are saying. I mean, I just kind of feel like it's not, to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's one of those ones, um, I, I don't know, there's just a certain kind of perception at times that there's a lot of negativity in the world, and I, I, don't, think it, I, don't, I don't think it matches. I think there's, uh, even if there, it's not about positivity and negativity. We're talking about immorality and morality. And there's more morality than there is immorality. Mm. That's just the truth. Mm. We can look towards, uh, sure, we can look towards industry. How many moral things are happening in regards to industry on the physical workplace? A lot of different stuff. The person who sends a, a shipment package over here, isn't that like a moral thing? To, I think for some of it, it could be. I think it could be considered. Mm. Because there might be more negativity than positivity on this earth, but the, the thing about it, um, is that we can, uh, the kind of negativity and positivity, mm. and regardless, because what, can we not live in a certain kind of balance without getting attacked or harmed to a certain degree? Mm. I mean, this is the case of so, all right, okay, correct. And then saying that it's something that it isn't, well, you know, to a certain degree, all right. Anyway, a really good chapter. Um, I don't know, I think there's this, but there's also a bit of emphasis in regards to some of the mind control stuff. Um, and I, I think that there, that that's, uh, the lens, again, at times I've seen multiple lenses uh, where we only progress this referring to theocrats. I, some would say that it's a certain sect, uh, a certain sect in regards to certain other dimensional. Um, others say that it's a pretty good metaphorical in regards to uh, good versus evil, <laughs> um, you know, that, that, that sort of thing. Um, and uh, I think that there is good theocrats in, in a certain manner. I think that there is a good thing in regards to that um, to a certain degree. I'm also adding for clarifications, if need be, the way Reed Spirit Guides indicate. Um, and I, I think that that could be a difficulty. Uh, and I don't know, I, I think there is places where he described it in one of his chapters uh, that is similar. But the problem with it is that understanding his uh, perception is like, did he feel like that was it? And any other bad spirit that existed out there, would it be considered a theocrat or not? Mm. Like, and, and if you felt that it wasn't, I, then, then I would might, you know, disagree with a certain degree um, in a certain context. Because I feel like there is multiple kinds of bad spirit that exist out there. Um, but, you know, I don't know if that was his viewpoint or perception of the author. So I, I, am, I, I am curious to, to find out if, if that was or not. Because I don't know, I think multiple lenses in regards to it, it is scary. Um, I've had spirit uh, around me affect uh, my life in multiple kinds of matters, in negative fashions at times, uh, but also in positive, uh, you know, fashions. You know, it's these it's these kind of psychics and, and spiritualists that are writing down some of this information that need those enlightened experiences at times. A burst of of like just one moment can change everything. You 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 give them that moment and says that hey, there is a good moment here, but then they say the opposite for the but no. They, <laughs> Forget about it. Just that right there. All right. Well, okay. Well, whatever. You know, why not? Whatever for a reason. Bob. All right. Well, whatever for a reason. It's correct. You know why. I don't view it that way. Just this. Right. Okay. Correct. Well, you, you do not view it that way for a reason. You don't view it that way. You don't know why. I prompted certain kind of reasons as to why I feel the way I do, the ways it means for God's end. All right, fine. And it looked, like, as it does, to a certain degree. Well, in regards to what we for God's end, it didn't happen. Um, several of the main pulses. Yeah, it's interesting they talk about play, uh, pain and pleasure. I have felt uh, the stimuli of that be uh, I think there is a thing about interpretation pertaining to pain and pleasure. 
there was something about it. He read it, and it was like the answer on there said no. That that part is that, that part of it is objective. The neural impulses we call pain are not the same as the ones we call pleasure. They have different electrical characteristics and travel over different circuits within the nervous system. And while I agree with that, I also I feel like there is that sort of thing that says that. Like, is that like an in front of the scenes interpretation? If someone was to interpret like that in front of the scenes and it would change that, I mean, is there like, what's, is there like some sort of like power difference? Like, well, no, wait a minute. Like, what's going on with that if you were to like pinch yourself and you didn't feel pain but pleasure? Hmm. Like, I, I just felt like there is something there um, in regards to interpretation um, and that somehow you can interpret certain things uh, in a certain manner, specifically in regards to different kinds of energies to a certain degree and, and and potentially change them in regards to certain kind of interpretation but when we get into, in front of the scenes energies like you know physical pain and physical pleasure i think that that one's uh, you know takes a little bit more oomph, a little bit more power uh, to achieve that to a certain degree um i don't know i just i just felt it to be interesting that's all Yeah, I think there's only so much that, that certain uh, certain body groups uh, can you know do to a certain extent. Um, I think we are protected. I think we are defended. I think that that's one thing that needs to be understood is that I have seen multiple kinds of safety and defenses uh, that have taken place, um, and you know I have had a certain kind of focus in regards to to the negative at times, although explaining it in a certain fashion, and that's a true. Um, but one of the things I've been looking at it from, you know, these days is the, that, you know, hey, okay, so there was a battle, that, that, you know, spiritual battle that took place. And then all of a sudden it's like, you know, oh, did I get attacked? Did I get harmed? Well, why were we getting attacked? You know, focusing on that sort of thing rather than saying, hey, look at all the defense that happened here. And, and when you look at that, it's like, whoa, like that is a, a bit of a perspective flip. To, well, but you can also, be, you could be both. That's the case of the perspective. But why does it always have to be one or the other? What about those who want to be able to look at both? Uh, and that is the case. I've been focusing more on that sort of stuff that says, hey, there's been spiritual defense instead of focusing on like all the times I got attacked, all the, all the times that I got defended. And it's it's one of those things that sort of took place, took hold. Past two weeks, one of the things that also changed was, um, you know, that's one of that's one of those defenses. That's what I should talk about. Yes, yeah, the next one, yes. Monday, make it so. Freaking heck, that was it. That one's about, yeah, it's, uh, you know, reading spiritualist con uh, content, uh, going to uh, conferences, going to meetups, uh, reading about uh, another one, uh, life coaches. But I, I think that that's like, I think that can be part of spiritualism and, and spirituality. I mean, I think that a lot of things can be a part of spirituality, but, uh, you know, it's, it's one of those things that I feel like there is, a, a, you know, there is sometimes when you look at like, you know, psychics, you know, near-death experiencers, you do sometimes have a certain kind of, uh, you know, in regards to it. But there is expanded uh, in regards to the term of spiritualist, I feel, to a certain extent. Um, so one, but one of those things I feel like, like motivation, motivation in life coaches, I feel like that's, that's part of that sort of subject, spiritualism, and things of that nature, because uh, they do really good work. I mean, you listen to a motivational speech, it's just like, whoa, just like, you can do it. <laughs> it's like... I'm like, okay, <laughs> well, all right, then fine. You don't know why. It's not like that. It's like something else, but I can't say it. I don't know how to say it right now. Um, anyway, yeah, yeah, great chapter, great reading. Uh, we're going to read uh, chapter 14 next time. Um, yeah, I know this from uh, Divine Rain Spirit Guides. Our advocating for uh, conversations at Wayne's Guys in regards to War in Heaven by Kyle Griffith. Uh, can we display where Wayne Spirit Guides in the Wayne's Guys